Welcome, welcome. We're going to try to uh, touch a little bit uh, until people would come in within the next five minutes regarding some of the assumptions and uh, tenets of Baha'i religion in general. And obviously, Baha'is believe in uh, messengers of God coming from the same God, and they come during different times, and they bring in... Uh, instructions, which in Christian term is Holy Spirit, every once in a while to, to conduct, uh, make sure they regulate activities of humanity. So God never leaves uh, his children alone and uh, throughout the times sends these messengers to educate really humanity. So Baha'is believe in really one religion and this is really uh, progressive and as time uh, requires, God sent his messenger to teach uh, humanity how to interact and what kind of knowledge they need to really coexist and propagate. And ironically, the only thing that Baha'is believe is predestination is, is civilization of humanity is predestined. That means that we would not dis destruct ourselves and a very bright future is in front of us and most of this future comes through the Holy Spirit or Word of God that has come to us so uh, we don't differentiate between uh, Zoroastrians or uh, let's say uh, Christians we think all of these religions uh, came from the same God and continuation of this large propagation of word of God throughout history of mankind. So we don't have infidel between us. We are, they are all equal as far as religion is concerned. And why those messengers didn't bring these uh, laws early enough is because humanity wasn't mature enough to be able to comprehend it. And ironically, during time of uh, Jesus, when he introduced uh, spirit. That was a completely departure from this traditional uh, idea that the a body of man, when it, uh, when it dies, it turns to dust and nothing would remain. So how Jews were, were uh, seeing their continuation of their culture was to their children, uh, generally, because they didn't think that they, anything of themselves would stay around. So when Jesus came in and introduced this spirit, which was uh, really difficult for people to understand because they couldn't put their hands on it. They couldn't touch it. So these are ideas that depends on maturity of humanity. These instruction sets becomes much wider and wider. And newer knowledge come through holy manifestations to us. So make us go closer and closer to this golden age of human civilization in general. So this series, I think uh, most of us are here, what I started was initially to describe how Baha'i religion uh, started during Qajar dynasty and obviously majority of the early believers were Muslims and came in from Shia Twelvers and their beliefs and their uh, end of times and uh, a, a scholar uh, by the name of Sheikh uh, uh, Ahmad Ahsai created a new movement which had conflict with Shia Twelvers and ironically he borrowed some ideas from uh, Sufism in terms of elements in Quran that describes the end of time is really allegoric, it's not material. Uh, the stars would not fall on earth. It would be counterproductive because it would destroy the earth. Nothing would remain anyways. So that's how this uh, Baha'i religion expanded. And of course, this and Sheikh Ahmad Ahsai and his uh, uh, disciple, which is Sayyid Qasim al-Rashti, they were looking for and they said the coming of the uh, Messiah is imminent. And that's how uh, we went through the process of 
concept of the Sufism at the time or uh, of uh, basically mysticism in general and how they divided these, these worlds in general. So that's where we really stopped and now uh, we're going into a self-assessment environment and really try to describe Baha'is believe actually science and religion are one and the same or extension of each other. So if science, Abdul Baha says science is in contradiction to, uh, I'm sorry, religion is contradiction to known science, then the religion is wrong. It shouldn't be. Because they're continuation of same reality. Physical reality, which we experience, and spiritual reality are continuation of same reality in general. So no conflict should occur between religion and science in general. Now here, there are many, many ideas related to, came from Sufism that, look, uh, we, and by the way, Sufism has a very interesting tendencies, and that is that they're pantheic religion. That means that they believe a piece of God is in each individual. And that's why uh, the behavior of the people are not really under their own control. And collective consciousness of all these people actually makes God. It's very interesting. But this concept was actually a major uh, vehicle that propagated Islam in the entire uh, Middle East and Far East. Uh, to, uh, they, it went to China, Philippines, Russia, and so on and so forth. So Sufism was the vehicle that uh, blocked even imperialism of uh, Europeans to really penetrate those areas uh, overall. In, uh, I think, uh, between, for example, 10th to 14th century, which was the start of Renaissance, there were uh, territories, Islamic territories, were three times larger than Christian territories. So Islam was really propagated in the entire world. It was a dominant religion at that time. So what I wanted to do is really go and describe this particular, some of our behaviors, especially people like me, darker skin that come from the, the East. We have some of these ideas which came from Sufism that really uh, doesn't allow us to progress. And obviously we believe that the new religion, which really describes reality the way it's supposed to be, allows us to once we know what reality is, apply it and make that progress or bring about that civilization that, that the manifestations have uh, promised in general. So Sheikh Ahmad Asai was very critical of Sufis because he, he knew that there is no peace of God in us in general. So let's start. Uh, this self-assessment process is we want to know who we are what characteristics we have, where in journey of life we are, where are we actually, what do we actually practice? Belief, having a belief doesn't mean that you're pra practicing your own belief and people are not really aware of it uh, overall. And how do you acquire knowledge and how do you know the knowledge you have acquired is really the truth generally and of course uh, the slides were so large I couldn't fit them in one session, so hopefully we would uh, go to the second, the, uh, those last two paragraphs are left for the hopefully next session, which is where do I want to go? If I know what the knowledge is, where do I want to go? And then who do I want to be? Because we can be whoever we want to be. So there is really no limitation in general. So this concept of predestination, faith, and this stuff that really mostly is Eastern culture really doesn't have any roots in sciences. Or for example, people say that I am a neurotic person and this is God made me, made me this way. You know, it's, this is how I'm born, which is really not the truth. 
And we need to see the characteristics that we acquire. How does it come about in general? And whether it's really we're born that way or we're acquiring based on interpretation that we have of events that occur in our lives makes us behave that way. And without any consciousness, we practice that without even knowing. So let's start with the objective of this course soul spiritual progress what when we pass on what do we take with ourselves we know that uh, from a material or physical reality you can't carry anything with yourself the only thing that you have is your spirit or soul and what assets do you take with yourselves when you pass on and of course the asset uh, so what are these assets that we're taking with us, uh, generally? And ironically, as we know, the soul, soul of a man, is product of the knowledge and learning that we have. Our progress, progress of our soul is not really limited based on innate or inherited characteristics that we have when we we're born. Baha'is believe that our soul get emanated from God, not manifested, emanated, that means like a painting that God paints in the body. So we get created at the time of conception, our soul, and it has some innate or inherited characteristics. But majority of our spirit what emanates from our soul really comes from learning. So who we are if we are object of our understanding. And application of that knowledge. Having the knowledge, not applying it, doesn't do anything. So here, our free will that allows us to apply the, no, apply the knowledge or Holy Spirit, what came from God for the latest manifestation, is really forms our character. And this is really the key. Not initial human characteristics. So who we are, it's not where we started from. Who we are is what we learn. That's what we're trying to, to achieve. And this is one of the Baha'u'llah's uh, uh, writings, which is very interesting. Even as it had been said, not everything that a man knoweth can be disclosed. Nor can everything that he can disclose be regarded as timely. Nor can every timely utterance be considered as suited to the capacity of those who hear it. So I'm committing a sin because I don't know what I'm talking about either. <laughs> so <laughs> now what we started from, and this, these are a couple of slides from last time, was that in uh, Baha'i religion, we Baha'u'llah separated this. this. These charts are right before his declaration of there is a world of Hahut, which is really essence of God is there. And no one can have access to that. So it's called unknowable essence of God. Then there is a lahut, which is really prophets manifest in all realms. Lahut is the essence of the prophet, basically. And it's called perpetual heaven. What it is is that we Baha'is believe that soul of a manifestation is different from a soul of a man. And they're pre-existent. That means it's not emanated from God at the time of conception. So when you look at Jesus, Moses, uh, Buddha, Krishna, uh, Muhammad, uh, all these souls pre-existed in the realm of Lahut. So when they get a physical form, this particular spirit gets infused in the body when they come to this world. And that's the reason they're not time dependent. All of them know the history, the, the before and after. They know all sciences. 
So based on necessity of the time, they release the amount of information that humanity can absorb at the time that they come in. So there is really no difference whether Moses knew more than Jesus or Jesus knew more than Muhammad or Muhammad knew more than or Baha'u'llah knew more than, for example, Moses. All of them have access to all knowledge, but they dispense only the portion that they think humanity can absorb at that time. So this Jabarut is area where realm of revelation of God, and this shouldn't be confused with the religion or revelation in the material world. This is actually the exercise of, of knowledge of the religion or Holy Spirit in the world called Jabarut. This is where the religion gets created. And then we have Malekut, which is really a, a realm of human soul after you pass on. And Nasut is actually a physical world that we're in. So our spirit comes from this Malekut, gets created at the time of conception, and eventually goes back here. Now, humans can operate in Malekut and Nasut. That's the area that we can go. God operates in all the realms, and uh, of course, manifestations operate in Lahut, Jabarut, Malakut, and Nasut. So that's really the concept uh, of mysticism. And remember, Baha'u'llah uh, came and tr was trying to, at the time, obviously, we, as we mentioned, uh, to really, uh, the scholars of the time were had this kind of belief as far as the worlds of God is concerned. So let's see the, the same picture in a different form as far as time-based. That means that eternity or lahut, so this is the English name for it, eternity, world of God attributes being manifest. Uh, of course, I apologize, we need to start with Hahud. Hahud is where the God is and nobody else. This is essence of God. It's unknowable essence that we, don't, we can't find out what it is. The Hahud, Lahud, or eternity, world of God's attribute being manifested within his Godhead manifestation, or seed or essence of the prophets. That's where the prophets are. And as you see, they've been... There is no beginning, no end to it. So they've been around all the time. Their spirit has been all around. Here, perpetuity or jabarut, this is the world that they were discussing, is that it has no beginning, but it has an end. What is this similar to? It's religion, basically. When it comes in, it has a period of time, although it pre-existed. When it comes in, it has a determined end, generally. Now here you have uh, uh, duration or malakut, which has known beginning, but it has no end. What is this? This is like a spirit of man. Because when it's born at the time of inception, it would live forever. So whatever understanding you have in this world, you better like yourself, because you're stuck with yourself for eternity. <laughs> so this is, this is an issue of, of out of our own free will, we can acquire the knowledge, apply it, and those augmented characteristics is the, the assets that we take with ourselves from the realm of Nasut or physical world to this duration or Malakut which has a beginning and no end, generally. So this was the philosophies that, that uh, discussed. So now what we're discussing is really these two realm in terms of is that characteristics that we have in this uh, physical world, is it really given by us, uh, given to us by God? Is it really inherited uh, or really is acquired? 
Do we have any control over it or not? Now, what we're trying to do is really map this scientifically to social sciences. As we discussed before, we know sciences are two separate sciences we have. These two major branches of science. One is physical sciences, like physics, for example, mathematics, engineering. It's a physical science, and it would, once it's discovered, it would be the same. And you have another segment which is really called social sciences, right? And guess what? Every time they try the social sciences, it moves a little bit. So it's really changes by time, changes by condition of humanity, changes by uh, environment that people live in. Social, so social sciences are variable, physical sciences are fixed. Now let's look at religion. Religion has the same also. All religions are, are two segments. One, which is common across all of them, what are those? Those are attributes of God. That is innate in us anyways. We're born with it. Like uh, ability to love. You have uh, benevolence, forgiveness, uh, piety. All these things across. There is no religion that, that promotes opposite of these attributes of God. So as you see, the segment that is fixed are these attributes of God. The only segment in religion that changes, very similar to social sciences, is really human interaction. What kind of laws do we need so we interact in, as the physical sciences grow to harness, get benefit from sciences? And of course, not to destroy each other. So these Holy Spirit or manifestations of God come in before those discoveries occur. And if you look at history of mankind, you see burst of civilization that occurs right after manifestation comes in. It starts enormous amount of discoveries occur right after manifestation. So God doesn't leave his children alone and say, look, go find out yourself. They give us the instruction, but we have free will. He's given us free will. He gives us the inst instruction set, but it's up to us to apply it. If, for example, Muhammad at the time of his uh, dispensation would say equality of man and woman, everybody would revolt and nobody would become Muslim. So he had to slowly, based on capacity of humanity at the time, dispense these laws. Where Baha'u'llah, 160 years ago, said no, Men and women are equal. Humanity has reached a point where they can absorb this reality. And unless man and woman, like two wings of the same bird, would not be equal, this, this uh, bird will not fly. So these are, as you see, the laws changes as humanity develops capacity to understand and apply it uh, generally. So, what is the soul in the Baha'i religion is really a, is simple. First of all, it's not a complex, uh, it's not like a brain. It's outside our body, it surrounds our body. It's simple, it's new, it's everlasting. So, we don't believe in reincarnation. So, every soul is unique and is born at the time of inception and will live forever. And it has two characteristics, obviously, at the time of uh, uh, conception, where inherited, which you get from your parents, uh, generally. Uh, if your uh, family have olive skins, obviously your, your skin will not be white when you're born. And innate, which are really characteristics that, that comes individually to you. And they're all good. In Baha'i religion, there is no man that is born that is bad. There is no characteristics of a man, that, no, no innate or inherited characteristics that is bad. Everyone is born pure and good. They, they get defiled as they acquire knowledge, maybe bad knowledge or wrong knowledge. And they apply it in a wrong manner. 
So character of a man, Abdul Baha says, character is formed by use of innate and inherited all good characteristics to acquire knowledge and behavior. Therefore, character of a man is mostly acquired, which is formed through education. So it's education that is really causing us to behave the way we do. Now, we're trying to go scientifically to find out the uh, psychologist, how they describe this, and what is the relationship of behavior of human to what Baha'i religion says. So the first segment really relates to uh, individual character, uh, generally. So uh, how actually the individual character is formed. It's obviously it's God-given characteristics which is innate and inherited, all good. The learning process occurs up to 15 years old. That means that this process is really formative age of a human being. Majority of what we learn is during this period. That's why it's very, very important, education of children in Baha'i religion. Uh, teaching them Obviously, spiritual education, which really comes from Holy Spirit, comes from the last manifestation. Obviously, colloquial uh, education, sciences and logic. And Baha'is at the time, they started to uh, direction of the manifestation to build uh, schools. And this is at the time of uh, uh, Qajar, where Baha'is were building schools and clergy was against it because they said, no, all the knowledge is in Quran and you don't need anything else. So it was quite interesting and they were fighting Baha'is because through Holy Spirit, the instruction to teach your children and de develop uh, sciences within them, understanding of sciences was one of their mandate generally through Holy Spirit. So colloquially, Colloquial education, science and logic was important. Parents' behavior and supervision has impact in how we acquire knowledge during the formative age of our uh, children, generally. That's how, and of course, culture and environment, socioeconomic class that you come up. So Baha'is believe that up to 15 years old, really your parents are responsible for your behavior, your, your uh, teaching and nurturing. And after 15 years old, beginning of youth, you're responsible for yourself. So even though you may come up from a very poor area or maybe people that don't believe in God at all, after 15, you're 15, you become beginning of the adulthood, you're responsible for your own destiny. That means that you have to do, and first principle of Baha'i religion is independent investigation of the truth. That means you have to go seek it. Whether it's science, you have to seek it. Whether it's religion, you have to seek it. That's why Baha'i children are not, that are born in Baha'i religion, they don't become automatically Baha'is. They're actually taught other religion until they become 15 years old. And at that time, they can choose to become a Baha'i or not. Nobody's forced to become a Baha'i. And then, of course, the independent investigation of the truth, it's a major aspect of Baha'i religion. Now, once you acquire the knowledge, is the exercise of, of that knowledge, which is really Holy Spirit. In Christian term, it's synonymous with Holy Spirit in general. And of course, application of true fear, free will. We can choose to do it or not to do it. So our destiny really relates to not only the knowledge that we gather, it's through our free will apply it, have certitude that the Holy Spirit would create that utopic environment or heaven and hell that we're discussing, even in this world. Baha'is don't believe in a physical heaven or hell, uh, generally. Heaven and hell is with us here, and we will be in other worlds of God. And that is closeness to God, or closeness, application of Holy Spirit, or far from it. 
And guess what? The, almost one fourth of population of the United States is on Prozac. You know why? Because they violate Holy Spirit and their spirit or their soul is in pain. And the way they try to suppress this is they pick pills because they're depressed. Instead of thinking, of, why am I this depressed? Because you're violating the basic Holy Spirit laws. So let's look at the uh, parent influence and behavior or model. We look at these concepts. I've talked to uh, some of these parents that have twins and said, look, the environment is the same, right? They grew up in the same, going to the same school. The parents are the same. They even look like each other, right? And uh, the socioeconomic is the same. But what we see is that one is very spiritual person or maybe very advanced in physical reality. They progress materially very well, the other person doesn't. So therefore, these are characteristics of these humans. So this gives a notion, um, almost false notion, that really people, people's fate is predefined. But we will see that although the innate and inherited characteristics are different than anyone else, the only impact the knowledge that we have, or innate or inherited characteristics that we have, is related to the progress in material world. Materially, we can progress if you're a very smart person. But spiritual reality, progress of the spirit, has no limitation, no bounds whatsoever. There is no limit of how much you can love. There is no limit of how much you can uh, forgive. There's no limit. So all those attributes of God, progress that we discussed, has nothing to do with innate or inherited characteristics. So who we want to be as a human being is how well, to our own free will, apply these laws that come from the Holy Spirit. That's who we become. So if we divide the same way that the, we divided the cosmology of uh, Baha'i religion, I divided this obviously based on obvious Baha'i uh, writings. There is an embryonic stage which prayer, prayers and mother spiritual has influence also. Well, Abdul Baha says that if you read prayers, it influences even uh, the embry embryonic stage of, of human being in mother's womb, generally. Infancy, in the embryonic stage and in early infancy, the reasoning power is totally absent. Obviously, when you're an infant, there is no reasoning power there. This doesn't mean that, that the soul doesn't exist, but those characteristics has not manifested itself yet. Childhood of pu puberty, most fertile condition for learning. And then you go to youth, which is beginning age of maturity, which is fi fixed at 15 in Baha'i religion. And of course, adulthood, and this is where, more, where most of us are. Uh, this relates only to purely uh, the adulthood in Baha'i religion, uh, up to age 21, you cannot vote. And, but this doesn't mean that, that uh, this period of uh, youth, this age of 15 is where the obligation of performing those rituals of the religion becomes mandated in terms of getting engaged in the Baha'i society. Currently, to in, get engaged in elections of Baha'i religion, you have to be 21. And of course, this is adulthood that we described, 
and of course old ages, which is set at 70. Once you reach 70, you don't have to, although you can pray, but you're not forced to pray every day. We have, uh, so these are really time sequences in by religion uh, in general. Now, obviously, based on that assumption, we, we want to see what uh, Baha'u'llah and Abdul Baha say about the education of children. The proper education of children is vitally important to the progress of mankind, and the heart and essential foundation of all education is spiritual and moral training. When we teach our fellow men the truths and way of life of Baha'i faith, we have to struggle against barriers of indifference, materialism, superstition, and a multitude of erroneous preconceptions. But in our newborn children, we are present with pure soul, untarnished by the world. As they grow, they will face countless tests and difficulties. From their earliest moments, we have the duty to train them, both spiritually and materially, in the ways that God has shown. And thus, as they come to adulthood, they can become champion of his cause and spiritual and moral giants among mankind equipped to meet all tests and will be indeed stars of the heaven of understanding. So soft flowing waters upon which must depend the very life of all men. So education of children has become very, very important. Baha'i children must surpass other children. It is incumbent upon Baha'i children to surpass other children in acquisition of sciences and art. Now if you look at, for example, during the time of Baha'u'llah, all of these things were shunned by the mullahs and clergy because they would lose control if everybody knew sciences, if, if everybody could read Quran themselves and they didn't need an interpreter. So you see how con contrast between, of course, nowhere in Quran says you shouldn't teach your children, but because, like any other religion, it has a uh, zenith, which occurred in 13th century, toward the end of the religion, you see mullahs or clergies have altered the religion to such a point where it was causing actually damage, it was causing harm, uh, generally. The heart of Abdul Baha longed in its love to find that youth, Baha'i young people, each and all, are known throughout the world for their intellectual attainments. There is no question but that they will exert all their efforts, their energies, their sense of pride to acquire the sciences and arts. So now you see the contrast of this new manifestation, new mandate that came from, uh, as part of Holy Spirit to humanity. And this is very interesting. Uh, it is extremely difficult to teach. This is Abdul Baha's uh, uh, writing. The individual and refine his character once puberty is passed. By then, as the experience that had shown, even if every effort be exerted to modify some tendencies of his, it all uh, availed nothing. He may perhaps improve somewhat today, but let it a few days pass and he forget it and turn it backward to his habitual condition and accustomed ways. Therefore, it is in early childhood that a firm foundation must be laid. While the branch is green and tender, it can easily be made straight. So this is really very important of how, and why do I mention this? Obviously, most of us are adults. It's for us to recognize it's very difficult for us to change. It's to change our ideas because our brain is an analog machine. It's a sensory machine. And it creates realities for ourselves. And the only way we can know what is real or not is really compare it to Holy Spirit. Do I, my actions are aligned with attributes of God? Am I, uh, do I love enough? Do I, am I forgi for, forgive, forgiving enough? And so on and so forth. 
Uh, this is another thing. They ask Abdul Baha, because in all manifestations, all manifestations mention when Messiah comes, everybody would be able to see it. And it's, this is in Bible. But Abdul Baha says the secret itself is visible everywhere to every eye. Every eye, Abdul Baha once said, speaking of the promise that every eye should see the return of Christ, but not the blind. So if you, if you blind yourself, there's no way you can see Jesus when he comes. So you have to be very careful to have this openness. Search for the truth. If physically we close our mind, obviously, if God comes down, we, will not, we won't recognize it. So these are really critical aspects to really examine. The whole concept is self-examination. Who, who are we, generally? Is, is who we are product of our experience in this life or and our free will? Or this is innate. You know, God made us this way, and it's not our fault, generally. Now, distinction between, between all men becomes realized after departure from this mortal world. So the question becomes of, of this heaven and hell that in the prior dispensers they were discussing. Really, obviously, there is no physical hell and heaven. It was interesting. Actually, Pope uh, recently, last few years, have changed the doctrine of, of Christianity to move away from physical hell and heaven. I was surprised when I read this. Generally. So you see that most of these Baha'i Baha doctrines is seeping into the general understanding, even religious context uh, as well. So here, the difference and distinction will naturally become realized between all men after the departure from this mortal world. But this distinction is not in respect to place, but it is in respect to the soul and conscience. For the kingdom of God is sanctified free from time and place. It is another world and another universe. But the holy souls are promised the gift of intercession. This is very interesting. That means that if your soul becomes pure in this world, that means that you, you acquire almost infallibility, that you become, you do no harm to anyone, and your life becomes a... Uh, pillar of helping other people and helping to make civilization go forward, which is, as we mentioned, is the promise of God to humanity in general, then once you pass on to the world of Malekut, it allows you to, to intercede. That means that help people that are in this plane, Malekut. So if you become pure, there's a gift at the end of the time when you go to the other world that, that you can actually help your own uh, maybe family members, your, your people that you know. You can intercede between God and help them through obviously visions in general. So here, uh, there are six types of motion that, that Abdul Baha describes, which is very interesting. So in Baha'i religion, if you're constant, anything that is constant dies. So do not think that, you know, I'm getting old and I want to retire. Guess what happens when you're tired? So never you should, you should separate yourself from motion. Because when you do that, you pass on. So there's a motion of transit that is from place to place, revolution of earth, for example. Another kind is the motion of inherent growth when we go from childhood to adulthood. The third is the motion of condition when we are sick and become well. So this is the fourth motion is that of spirit. For instance, the child while in the womb of mother has all the potential qualities of the spirit, but those qualities, those qualities begin 
to unfold little by little as child is born and grows and develops, finally manifesting all the attributes and qualities of the spirit. So there is a motion of spirit also. So you continuously, whether you like it or not, your spirit grows as you're absorbing. Whether it's you're in a womb of a mother, this knowledge, this closeness to God. And some people go the other way also. In this world, of course. In the world that comes in Malekut, there is no regression. You don't regret. In the other world, Abdul Baha says, regression is equivalent of stagnation. If you stop, that means you're, you're re regressing, uh, generally. The fifth is the motion of intellect. And this is very important. That means your intellect is continuously increasing. Whereby the ignorant becomes wise. The sixth motion is that eternal essence or essence of God. So God creates these plans. So even God is not stagnated and creates all the time. So everything is in motion. So we shouldn't seek stability. We shouldn't seek protection or, and ironically, in our nature, we like that. You know, we like things to be routine, normal, the same all the time. As we see that when you reach that point and you, you lose the self motivation to change, that's where the, the death actually occurs. So you have to be continuously improve yourself, uh, generally. And now let's see, uh, in other words, man must, throughout all the degrees of life, evolve and progress day unto day, for life is continuous. The manifestors of divine law have appeared so that they may confer upon man an ideal power which will enable him to advance along all the degrees of human attainment. The power of the world of existing is limited while the power of God is unlimited. If the reality of man should not be confirmed by a divine power, human progress would terminate. So God always intercedes in this reality. Of course, we have childhood, youth, and this is de describing maturity, uh, which new powers of man becomes available. So let's look at human soul again. As we said, it's uh, at the time of conception. The character of man is formed by use of innate and inherited characteristics to acquire knowledge and behavior. Therefore, character of man is mostly acquired, which is formed through education. That's why education has been the most emphasized element. Even the status of teacher in Baha'i religion it's more advanced than any other profession because you impact and the status of mother is so high in the Baha'i religion because the first teacher of children are, are their mothers, not their fathers, generally. So these are psychology devised these characteristics. Now we want to know, and the, this is how science of sociology and psychology define these, these five types of characteristics. And we should look at this, and at the end, hopefully in the, in the next session, we answer these types of characteristics. But first, we need to examine what are these threats, what are these characteristics, actually, that scientists have defined. That this person is, for example, neurotic. And by the way, you have to realize that this is, this is an approximation or uh, it's a statistical evaluation. It's not a precise, you can't say one person is this or that. And there are obviously some outliers to these as well. So openness, which really refers sometimes to intellect, is one characteristic. The, they say this person is an open person. Conscientiousness is another one. Threat, they say this person is really conscientious. Extraversion, which we see what it is. Agreeableness, this person is really cooperative. 
and of course neuroticism. This person is really uh, very suspicious of everyone. So these are the five categories. Uh, uh, so the neuroticism factor is sometimes called emotional stability as well, and of course the openness factor is related to intellect uh, at the same time. For example, uh, extraversion includes such related qualities as social, sociability, excitement, seeking impulsive and positive emotion. The five-factor model is purely descriptive model of personality, but psychologists have developed a number of theories to account for these big five, generally. So this is really the categories that the scientists say we, who we are, generally. Now, we need to understand that we don't have to be 100% one way or another. So they say in their methodology that when score of individual feedback, these threats are frequently presented as percentile score. So if you're, you do 80% of what conscientiousness people do, they call you a conscientious person. You don't have to be 100%. In the same form, an extraversion rating in the five rate, that means very low, you're, you're a very low extraversion uh, characteristics, that means that you like solitude, you like quietness, if it's only 5%. So you're 5% uh, extroversion. It, and it says that the exception may exist as well. So here, let's talk about openness or closed-mindedness. Openness uh, it's the person that is inventive, curious, versus the person that is cautious or conservative. Appreciates arts, emotion, adventures, unusual ideas, curiosity, and variety of experiences. The threat distinguishes imaginative people from down-to-earth conventional people. People who are open to experience are intellectually curious, appreciative of art, and sensitive to beauty. They tend to be, compared to close people, more creative and more aware of their feeling. They are more likely to hold unconventional beliefs. So this is really what openness is. Now, what are the samples of this openness? I have a rich vocabulary. I have, uh, I have a vivid imagination. I have excellent ideas. I spend time reflecting on these things. And I use difficult words, generally. So this is a sample... Uh, of uh, basically openness. Now, reverse of this is I am not interested in abstraction. I'm not, I do not have a good Im imagination. I have difficult understanding abstract ideas. You know, you, you like your own ideas, you don't want to change them, basically. So now let's look Consciousness, conscientiousness versus carelessness. Conscientiousness is a tendency to show self-discipline, act dutifully, and aim for achievement. The threat shows a preference for planned rather than spontaneous behavior. It influences the way in which we control, regulate, and direct our impulses. Conscientiousness includes a factor known as need for achievement. So now, what are the sample conscientiousness items? Is I'm always prepared. I'm ex exacting in my work. I follow a schedule. I get chores done right away. I like order. I pay attention to details. I leave my belongings around. Is the reverse of it. I make a mess of things. I often forget to put things back in their proper place. I shirk my duties. Extrovert extroversion versus introversion. This is the third um, characteristics. Extroversion is characterized by positive emotion, surgency, and the tendency to seek out s stimulation and the company of others. The threat is marked by pronounced engagement with the external world. Extroversion in enjoy being with people, often perceived as full of energy. They tend to be enthusiastic, action-oriented individuals who are likely to say yes or let's go. The reverse of this really is introverts lack the social exuberance 
and activity levels of extroverts, they tend to seem quiet, low-key, deliberate, and less involved in the social world. What are the sample? I'm life of the party. I don't mind being the center of attention. I feel comfortable around people. I start conversation. I talk to a lot of different people. Reverse of it, I'm quiet around strangers. I don't like to draw attention to myself. I don't talk a lot. I have little to say. There's no interest. Agreeableness. This is, again, is a tendency to be compassionate and cooperative rather than suspicious and antagonistic toward others. Trade reflects individual differences in general concern of social harmony. Now, reverse of this is disagreeable. Individual place self-interest above getting along with others. They are generally unconcerned with other well-being and are less likely to extend themselves for other people. The sample agreeableness, I'm interested in people, I feel other emotion, I have soft heart, I make people feel at ease, I sympathize with others, I take time out for others. I'm not interested, the reverse, again, is I'm not interested in other people's problems, I'm not really interested in others, I feel little concern of others, I insult people, <laughs> I like being isolated. Neuroticism is the tendency to experience negative emotions such as anger, anxiety, or depression. It is sometimes called emotional instability. Those who score high in neurotic neuroticism are emotionally reactive and vulnerable to stress. They are more likely to interpret ordinary situation as threatening and minor frustration as hopelessly difficult. Their negative emotional reaction tend to persist for unusually long period of time, which means they are often in a bad mood. These problems is in emotional regulation can dis diminish the ability of a person scoring high on neuroticism to think clearly, make decisions, and cope effectively with stress. Now, of course, reverse of neuroticism is at the other end. Individuals who score low in neuroticism are less easily upset and are less emotionally reactive. They tend to be calm, emotionally stable, and free from persistent negative feelings. Example, I am easily disturbed. I change my mood a lot. I get irritated. I get stressed out. I get upset easily. I have frequent mood swings. I often feel blue. I worry about things. I'm relaxed most of the time. <laughs> I seldom feel blue. So these are characteristics. So now we saw and the concept of the new psychology really categorized these people with the assumption that really these people adopt this type of behavior is because it's in their nature. It doesn't matter what you do with them. Eventually, they migrate toward being who they are. Therefore, the whole philosophy of... Uh, Psychology revolves around natural state of a human being that it has faults and cannot be corrected. Well, in Baha'i religion, hopefully next time, we'll go and try to describe this for each of these characteristics. There are direct segments in Baha'i writing that shows that if you follow that Holy Spirit, you would be a, an intellectual because or openness. Because you're falling. That if you violate those laws, if you violate those laws, you become a closed-minded person. So reality is, we can show next time, hopefully, that, that people adopt these characteristics because unknowingly or knowingly, they violate the Holy Spirit, these laws that come in. And interestingly, when you look at the implication of this type of characteristic, even in legal system. They say this person did this uh, horrible crime because in childhood uh, they were under distress. They try to analyze this particular process. Therefore, this child, uh, the, in his childhood he was abused and this and that. Therefore, we shouldn't punish him. In reality, Although there are cases where the individual has a mental disease, which, which is known. But majority of the time, really, is 
free will. We adapt these, these knowingly or unknowingly, these characteristics because we prefer it. So the key really becomes of, of uh, who we are is really outcome of knowing the knowledge and applying them. So if you're a neurotic person, it doesn't mean that you're born this way. That means that you made yourself become like that. And there's a way, now that you know it's, it's your characteristics is your own doing, you can undo it very easily by following those Holy Spirit. So you better read your books <laughs> because it allows you to change. Remember, if, if you're not in motion, you die. If you keep your characteristics, that means you don't change. And when you don't change, you die. And this is really the key. So there are four methods, and this is the last segment. I'm sure you're all tired. Uh, the last segment, there are many methods of acquiring knowledge. The first method is by sense. You touch, you, you uh, taste, and you say, I like. You see somebody doing something, and they get benefit from it. You see it, and you see this person is getting rich by doing something. And you say, why can I do that same thing? But the problem with this is that there is no standard. Or, for example, you look at a flower. Uh, you look at this rose, and it's pink, right? Most of us see this in pink, but we don't know what shade of pink it is. Why? Because our brain is analog. It processes information. It's not accurate. So you can't rely on your senses generally. Now, of course, if you uh, have a uh, device that measures the frequency of the light that reflected from the flower, which is pink, you know exactly what shade of uh, basically pink this fl flower is. And ironically, if you ask five people, you show them a red rose, they give you five different shades of, of rose because it's interpretive. We don't have a, a, a uh, our brain is analog. It interprets everything. And sometimes we see things like a, uh, uh, somebody um, uh, Imagining things, for example, and we truly believe it's true because we saw it. So you can't rely on your own eyes, uh, generally. And a good example of it are magicians, right? They make a, an elephant disappear, and truly, if you didn't have your cognitive capabilities, you really would think that the elephant disappeared, actually. So you can't rely on your sensi senses. The second method is reasoning. Now, reasoning is quite interesting. Uh, this ancient philosophical pillar, pillar of wisdom, this method of understanding, they prove things by reason, which makes sense. But what happens is that you can equally reason against it. So reasoning is not even an accurate science, although it helps us to achieve this. Now, what we're discussing relates to, again, the segment of the sciences which relates to social sciences. The same way the religion, we're talking about the segment which relates to the interaction of humans. Not the segment that is fixed. The attributes of God in man will never change. There is no manifestation will come and say, don't love anybody <laughs> or be a bad person. So here, the reasoning methodology that we're discussing, does discrimination against women make sense? Obviously, today it doesn't. Why? Because we can see those societies that discriminate against women, they're the most backward ones. They're economically harming themselves. Why? Because half of the population is, is not productive, generally. So you see that this method of reasoning is really not an accurate science applicable to the segment which is social, social sciences, generally. And I'm sure 
at the time of Muhammad, there was a reason because humanity at the time didn't have capacity to understand that. Otherwise, they wouldn't accept anything about <laughs> Islam <laughs> if they would disagree with one thing they couldn't comprehend. So the third method of understanding is by tradition. They say, look, my fathers did it, it worked uh, for them, so it would work for me. Obviously, this is not a method that would uh, be valid either. Because if they, made, if they made an error, you would make an, the same error again. So know then, to see what Abdul Baha says, that which is in the hands of people that which they believe is liable to error for improving or disproving a thing if a proof is brought forward which is taken from the evidence of our senses this method as has become evident is not perfect if the proof are intellectual the same is true or if the tradition such proofs also are not perfect therefore there is no standard in the hands of people upon which we can rely so we know that these have flaws, this methodology, although they're good, but the, the, it's not 100% perfect, these methodologies. So now the only thing that is left really is Holy Spirit or messages, writings that come from the manifestation. Like a physician that sees these manifestations, what humanity suffers from, they bring in those Holy Spirit, which is writings of, of uh, reality, and they're infallible. So for, the, for example, what the stance of the Baha'i people, Baha'i religion is, that unity of mankind is achievable today. So everybody would, should work toward that, that goal. Universal language is achievable today. Universal, for example, government is achievable today. Education is achievable for everyone on the planet is achievable today. So these are really bases of the new revelation or Holy Spirit that is the only methodology that is infallible. Now you can go to a, an area in maybe a rural area that never heard of this new religion or these instructions, and you see their practices in their own mind, because they're following their tradition, they're harming themselves. Although their, their, their religion is a true religion, but the segment which is related to the interaction of humans, it belongs to the realm of basically lahut, which existed, but it ends. It has a termination. The same instruction set that existed, that kept humanity out of trouble for over 1,500 years, Islam, terminated, no longer valid, when the new manifestation with which Baha'u'llah came in. Now, these are the instruction sets that we need to really get the civilization to the next stage. So this is what we should think about. People that do not read and exercise knowledge of God or Holy Spirit are prone to error. Because you, you rely on your own comprehension of what looks good to you, generally. Now um, we're going to stop here. The next segment, uh, which we're going to do, hopefully I didn't get you too tired, is really relate to each of those characteristics. We're going to show in Baha'i religion that there is, uh, there is actually a methodology in the Holy Spirit that teaches you how to become an intellectual. So, this notion that we are born with these characteristics, we're neurotic, this person is neurotic, it's not their fault, because that's how they were born, is really a false notion. And through the next stages of this, uh, uh, this talk, next time, we're going to bring in those segments from, from Baha'i writing that actually 
exposes these characteristics. So a person that becomes neurotic is because they're violating those instruction set. That's why they became neurotic. And now that you know it's your own maid, you have an ability to change it by following those, those laws. So that's the, the uh, next uh, topic that we're going to discuss in terms of showing Holy Spirit and how that implies with or uh, maps to what science says regarding individual characteristics and the contrast between assumption of psychologies versus reality that Baha'i religion is trying to promote. Thank you very much. Any questions?